Hello everyone and thanks for tuning in to Rollin' Ish. I'm Matt and in this video we're going to be talking to you specifically about the Trickery Domain and War Domain which are subclass options for the Cleric class available to you at level 1. If you haven't done so already please be sure to check out our Intro to Clerics and Knowledge Domain video where we talk about all the things that all clerics get in addition to introducing you to one of the first options for your divine domain, the knowledge domain. There's another uh, two videos that are on our page that cover specifically the light and life domains and the nature and tempest domains. And so in talking about the trickery domain, this is going to be a very uh, interesting and fun subclass for the cleric class that is going to be aiming towards the mischief makers and the instigators at the table um, that are going to challenge others uh, among both gods and mortals. So think about gods like Loki, um, if you're familiar with Critical Role, the Traveler. Um, these are Typically, the patrons of thieves and scoundrels, gamblers, rebels, uh, liberators. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be evil clerics. Just, you know, trickery clerics. Um, so, they are going to be a disruptive force in the world. They're going to puncture pride. They're going to mock the tyrants. They're going to steal from the rich and free captives. They're just going to cause chaos. Okay, so if that is... In your wheelhouse, the trickery domain might be a good option for you to choose for your cleric. The spells that you're going to get immediate access to in, in choosing this domain at first level are going to be Charm Person and Disguise Self. Obviously, Charm Person sounds like what it is. It lasts for an hour and you charm a person into viewing you as a friendly or an ally. Um, so that would be good in case you need to get past a guard or somebody is watching your over your party and they're suspicious of what you're up to and you want to keep your intentions concealed, charm person's the way to go. Whereas disguise self is essentially going to change your appearance uh, from one to another um, and allow you to... Um, be disguised and, and sneaky that way. At third level, you get access to a spell called Mirror Image and another one called Pass Without Trace. Mirror Image is fun. It's a second level spell slot, but essentially you create three illusionary duplicates of yourself to appear in your space. And until that spell ends, the duplicates move with you and mimic your actions, shifting position so it's impossible to track which image of you is the real one. You can use your action to dismiss this, but essentially each time a creature targets you with an attack during the duration, they're going to roll a d20 to determine whether the attack hits one of those targets uh, of your duplicates or you. Um, so this could really be a good way to get an enemy to waste its turn. Um, there's a little bit more to it. Um, the duplicates do have their own AC, which is comprised of 10 plus your dexterity modifier um, and it could really disrupt and make a hit a potential hit to you turn into a miss uh, and it could eventually disperse one of your duplicates but it could keep you up and standing and healthy for uh, a couple of turns depending on how many creatures are trying to attack you it's a good way to keep you safe and protected. A pass without trace requires your concentration up to an hour and essentially is going to give you a plus 10 bonus to you, you and your party's stealth uh, because you do get to choose um, <clears throat> yourself and uh, some companions that you can see within 30 feet of you. So as long as you and your friends stick together, you'll be able to... Um, be a little bit more stealthy than you would be naturally. At fifth level, you have access to Blink. Um, you roll a d20 at the end of each of your turns during the duration of a spell, uh, which lasts about a minute. On a roll of 11 or higher, you vanish from your current plane of existence and appear in the ethereal plane. So if you need to get out of there quickly to perhaps heal yourself, drink a potion, or set up your next move, 
this is a good spell to use. Dispel magic is what it sounds like. If there is a magical effect within range on a creature or an object, any spell of third level or lower on your target just is dispelled and it goes away. Anything for a spell of fourth level or higher on your target must make an ability check. Uh, you must make an ability check using your spell casting uh, modifier and the DC is going to be 10 plus the spell's level. So if you're targeting something that has a six level spell on it, the DC is going to be 16. 10 plus the sixth level of spell and you need to make that ability check to dispel the magic at seventh level you get access to dimension door where you could teleport yourself from your current location to any other spot within range that range being 500 feet um, you would arrive exactly at the spot desired it could be a place you could see one you could visualize uh, or one you could describe by stating a distance and direction. So I want to go 200 feet that way or what have you. You can bring along objects as long as their weight doesn't exceed what you can carry. And you can also grab one willing person who is the same size or smaller than you and all of its gear that they're carrying um, up to their carrying capacity. They must be within five feet of you. So if you've got a, a creature who's dying, let's say, and you want to get them out of the combat field, you can run up to them as long as they're within your range to touch them. Dimension door, get yourselves out up to 500 feet away to perhaps get that friend to safety. Um, that's a good way of utilizing a spell, just as an example. You also get access to polymorph, which could you uh, change yourself or another creature. Uh, into something else and that other creature if they are unwilling like an enemy they're going to make a wisdom saving throw to try and avoid this effect um this spell is going to have no impact on a creature that is a shapeshifter or something that has zero hit points but essentially um you are whatever you're turned into or you turn something else into they are that creature and use that creature's stat block until it is dropped to zero points, which they would revert back to their normal form. There's a, a little bit more detail to the spell if you want to check it out. It's in the back of your um, player's handbook where the spells are listed. It is Polymorph, and it is a fourth level spell. Pretty awesome. At ninth level, you get access to Dominate Person, which works like a charm, but in a, in a more direct way because you're dominating them. You can give it a command such as, go attack that creature, hand me your weapon, Go run over there, go grab me that object, um, and they will do that task to the best of their ability so long as it doesn't hurt or kill themselves. Um, <laughs> to withhold your dominance over that creature it requires your concentration for at least a minute, but it is a great way to utilize this spell to maybe sway numbers. Um, just keep in mind that if you are in combat, your target has advantage on the saving throw. So one of the things I had mentioned in a previous video where we go over the nature and tempest domains where this is also an option that comes up, I had mentioned that I had previously seen a cleric use this in a way that was in a verbal conflict. And as that conflict started to escalate closer and closer towards physical contact, the cleric used dominate person on somebody to um, uh, essentially sway them in into their favor. So uh, another spell you get access to is a fifth level spell called Modify Memory. It requires a minute of your concentration. And essentially, you can reshape somebody's perceived memory of something. It's, it works like a charm, so they need to be able to make a wisdom saving throw. And if they fail, you'll be able to um, use that charm to modify their memory of an event that it has experienced in the last 24 hours and lasted no more than 10 minutes. You can permanently eliminate a memory of, of that event or allow them to recall that event differently and believe it to be true. So a little bit more on that if you read into it, but essentially that is what that spell does in a nutshell. 
At first level, you get a feature called the Blessing of a Trickster, where you can use your action to touch a willing creature other than you to give it advantage on stealth. This blessing lasts for an hour or until you use this feature again. So I've seen this used where a um, cleric has touched the rogue who is trying to sneak in and into a, an area to do something, and this worked to their advantage. So that's a, a good use of that spell. The channel divinity option in this domain at second level is called Invoke Duplicity. As an action, you're gonna create a perfect illusion of yourself that lasts for a minute or until you lose concentration, as if you were concentrating on a spell. The illusion appears in an unoccupied space you can see within 30 feet, and as a bonus action on your turn, you can move the illusion up to 30 feet in a space you can see, but it must remain within 120 feet of you. For that duration, you can cast spells from it as if it were through you. So your enemies might not know which one is the real you because it is a perfect match. Additionally, when you and both you and your illusion are within five feet of a creature that can see an illusion, you get advantage on the attack rolls against that creature, given how distracted they are by seeing two of you. So that is a good use of that spell, or, or excuse me, of that channel divinity um, by saving a spell slot. So maybe you don't use mirror image in this case, you use invoke duplicity. And if you personally are out of range for one of your spells, your duplicate, you might be able to pop in range and use the spell casting through it. So that is a very, very cool feature to have, especially when it comes to, uh, to combat, like the way I described. You get another channel divinity feature at six level called Cloak of the Shadows. And in this instance, you use an action to become invisible until the end of your next turn. Um, it's it lasts a short while, but it could be useful if you're in a heist situation or you're trying to sneak something. Um, being invisible until the end of your next turn is what that's going to do. Now, you're going to disrupt that invisibility. Should you attack or cast a spell while invisible, you're going to reveal your location. Right? Because casting a spell oftentimes is going to have a verbal somatic, so they'll hear you. Or attacking, they're going to feel it. Right? So... Just remember that when using it. Um, your Divine Strike at 8th level will give you the ability to infuse your weapon strikes with poison. So while the Nature Domain allowed you to use cold or fire or lightning, while the Tempest Domain would use thunder, the Trickery Domain would use poison. This is a gift from your deity, and once at the, uh, on each of your turns when you hit a creature with a weapon attack, you can cause that attack to deal an additional 1d8 poison damage to that target. When you reach 14th level, this additional d8 turns into 2d8. At 17th level, you get improved duplicity, which means instead of a duplicate, you can create up to four duplicates of yourself when you use invoke duplicity. As a bonus action on each of your turns, you can move any number of them up to 30 feet to a max range of 120 feet from you. Remember, your duplicate has to be within 120 feet of you, but at 17th level, there could be you and four duplicates running around and your um, enemies are going to be very confused. This is a good way to keep your cleric safe and upright and continuing to uh, help your friends in the encounter. So, um, anybody who's watched Campaign 2 of Critical Role knows Jester the Cleric was a trickery domain cleric, and she, Laura Bailey played her beautifully, um, and it was a lot of fun to watch. This is going to be for your crazy friends at the table who get really creative. Let the chaos run through the trickery domain uh, cleric in that case. Next up, we have the War Domain. Now, this is going to be a, a cleric who is serving a god of war, um, somebody who is a great warrior and is all about excelling in battle and inspiring others to fight the good fight. So that is the war domain. I know that in a previous video I mentioned that the Tempest domain is tailor-made for combat, but I don't know if anything is going to top a war domain cleric when it comes to combat. Let me tell you why. 
the spells that you get access to uh, at first level are going to be Divine Favor and Shield of Faith. These are pretty simple spells. Divine Favor is a bonus action spell requiring uh, your concentration for a minute. It's basically a, a short prayer that you utter, and it allows your weapon to deal an additional 1d4 radiant damage on a hit in addition to its normal weapon damage. While Shield of Faith is also a bonus action spell, this is a concentration up to 10 minutes, so it is worth the first level spell slot and the bonus action to Shield of Faith yourself because it is going to give you a plus 2 to your armor class for the duration. Now, you're about to find out that War Domain Clerics get access to proficiency in heavy armor. Shield of Faith, regardless of your, your armor class, is going to add two to it no matter what. And as long as you maintain concentration for those 10 minutes, your AC is going to be very high and you will be very hard to hit. 10 minutes is a lot of time in combat, and this is a first level spell. And it doesn't have to even be yourself. You could use this on somebody else, and it's a bonus action. So just remember, in casting either of these bonus action spells, your action should be a weapon attack or a cantrip spell at best. Talk to your DM for other spell casting rules. At third level, you get access to magic weapon and spiritual weapon, two totally different things. Magic Weapon is a bonus action spell requiring an hour of your concentration, but what it does is it turns your mundane weapon, um, your non-magical weapon, into a plus one weapon. Um, so it'll give you a plus one to your normal uh, attack roll and damage roll as if it were a magic weapon. You can upcast this spell at higher levels, such as casting it at fourth level will, will make it a plus two weapon, Casting it at 6th level or higher will make it a plus 3 weapon, and it doesn't get higher than that. But it's a great bonus action spell, especially if you're considering making a melee attack with your action to use this magic weapon, help you overcome any resistances uh, to such damage, and make that attack. Whereas spiritual weapon is going to be you conjuring a ethereal spirit weapon. It's like a ghost weapon. <laughs> that floats you can point it up to 60 feet and make it appear uh, 60 feet in range of yourself as a bonus action on your turn you can move it up to 20 feet it does get its own attack roll um, that you can make a melee attack uh, and you basically treat it like an independent party member in the initiative order uh, at least that's how I play it at my table uh, on a hit, the target is going to take force damage equal to 1d8 plus your spellcasting modifier. Um, and, you know, talk to your DM about when that takes place. I typically like to put it in the initiative order or have it go immediately after the cleric's turn. At fifth level, you get access to two spells called Crusader's Mantle and Spirit Guardians. Crusader's Mantle is a concentration spell lasting up to a minute. Essentially, you're creating an aura within 30 feet, um, awakening boldness in friendly creatures. Until that spell ends, that aura is going to move with you, centered on you, in a 30-foot radius. While in that aura, any non-hostile creature will get an extra 1d4 radiant damage when they hit with a weapon attack. So it's kind of like using Divine Favor, whereas Divine Favor is a first-level spell and it's only for you. Crusader's Mantle is a 30-foot radius and extends that 1d4 additional radiant damage to your friends. So, different way to use, use a similar feature. Spirit Guardians is a third-level spell. It is concentration for 10 minutes, and essentially you're calling forth spirits to surround and protect you in a 15-foot radius. If you're good or neutral, those spectral forms appear as angelic or fey creatures. You describe what it looks like. If you are evil, they're more fiendish looking. But when you cast this spell, you designate any number of creatures that you can see to be unaffected by it. Affected creatures' speed is halved in that area and making it essentially difficult terrain. And when they enter your area for the first time or, or starts its turn there, because you could enter its space, um, they must make a wisdom saving throw, and if they fail, they're going to take 3d8 radiant damage if you're good or neutral. That damage turns into necrotic damage if you're evil aligned. 
On a successful save, they're going to take half that damage. So essentially, it's a 30-foot radius of spirits that fly around you. So if something comes in that radius, they're harmed. Or if you move to have your radius envelop a creature that's nearby that you're hostile against, you can attack them just by moving towards it. Very cool use of this spell, especially because it what happens with it is based on your alignment. I really like that a lot. When you reach 7th level, you get Freedom of Movement and Stone Skin. These are um, different spells. The Freedom of Movement lasts for an hour, and essentially for the duration, uh, you touch a willing creature and it is unaffected by difficult terrain. Any spells or other magical effects cannot reduce its speed nor cause the creature to be paralyzed or restrained. So this is a good use of spells against things that might use like webbing or uh, druids or other spellcasters that might try to create difficult terrain. Um, maybe you're in um, a wintry uh, like place and there's ice everywhere. This is a good way to help somebody move freely about. Um, and not be affected by that. Also, the target can spend five feet of their movement to automatically escape from non-magical restraints, such as a creature that has it grappled. Also, being underwater imposes no penalties on the target's movement or attacks, especially if they don't have a swim speed that would really hinder them. Freedom of movement really does give them freedom of movement in this case. Wonderful spell to have at your arsenal. Stone skin is pretty cool. Stone skin is going to require your concentration for up to an hour, but essentially you turn a willing creature's flesh as hard as stone. And until the spell ends, they're going to gain resistance to non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. It's kind of like a barbarian's rage, right? When a barbarian goes into rage, they get resistance to non-magical um bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage, it's kind of like giving that to them. No, this does not stack with a barbarian and make them immune, but it's a good way to protect your mages from this kind of harm uh, by making them take half damage in this case. At ninth level, you're going to get access to two different spells. One is Flame Strike, the other is Hold Monster. Flame Strike is essentially a instantaneous uh, column of fire it is a 10-foot radius. You can make it pop up anywhere within 60 feet of you. Any creature in that 10-foot radius, um, it's 40-foot high, I should mention. Um, they're going to be caused to make a dexterity saving throw. And any creature that fails it is going to take 4d6 fire and 4d6 radiant damage on a failed save, or half as much if they succeed. Very good way to inflict a lot of damage on a creature or creatures within a 10-foot radius. So you can get more than one. Hold Monster is what it sounds like. It is a concentration spell that lasts for a minute. You've got a 90-foot range on this one. Essentially, if they fail their wisdom saving throw, you're going to paralyze that creature and they're going to be held in place. This spell doesn't have any effect on undead. Uh, but essentially... Their turn is just as simple as making a, a repeat wisdom saving throw, and if they succeed, it ends the effect, but that's their turn. If they fail, that's it. That's their turn. You basically get them to waste their turn trying to break this hold. Um, if you use it at a spell slot of 6th or higher, because it's a 5th level spell, you can choose an additional creature uh, as long as they are within 30 feet um, of each other when you target them both. So that's pretty cool to know. So you can basically control the battlefield by holding someone so you can focus fire on, on others. Um, all right, at first level, you get proficiency in martial weapons and heavy armor. And also at first level, you get a feature called War Pri Priest. When you use the attack action, you get to do a second attack as a bonus action. So this is a way to essentially get that extra attack in early because you get this at first level um, with your War Domain Cleric. You can use this feature a number of times equal to your Wisdom Modifier. So again, if your Wisdom Modifier is two, you can do this two times before you replenish this feature with a long rest. 
So as, as long as you keep that wisdom modifier increasing with your ability scores, this will give you additional uses of your War Priest uh, feature, but it's essentially an extra attack. At second level, you get a channel divinity option called Guided Strike. When you make an attack roll, you can use a channel divinity to gain a plus 10 bonus to the attack roll. Um, you can make the choice after seeing what's on your die, but before your DM tells you it's a hit or miss. So if you are in that territory where you roll a 12 or a 13 and you're just not sure if that's going to be good enough to hit, you might want to call out, I'm going to use my Channel Divinity Guided Strike. That's going to turn that into a, a 22 to hit. Now you're more likely to get success with that. Very good feature. At 6th level, you get an additional option for your Channel Divinity, and this one's called War God's Blessing. Essentially, when a creature within 30 feet of you makes an attack roll, you can use your reaction to give them a plus 10 to their roll using a Channel Divinity slot. Same rule applies. They can see the die, but it's got to be before the DM says it's hit or miss. Um, so pay attention to your teammates while they're rolling because you could use War God's Blessing to really help them land that hit, especially if you know you're fighting something with a high AC. At 8th level, your Divine Strike, much like some of the other domains, uh, kicks in as well. And this is going to be a additional D8 of the damage type dealt by the weapon you are using. So where Nature Domain allowed you to choose between Cold Fire Lightning, Tempest Domain was Automatic Thunder Damage, this is going to be whatever your weapon did, add another D8, right? So if you're holding a, a, a weapon that does bludgeoning damage like a mace, this is going to be an additional D8 of, of bludgeoning damage for that, just as an example. When you reach 14th level, this feature goes from 1d8 to 2d8. Lastly, at 17th level, you get an avatar of battle. This means you get resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage from non-magical attacks. And it's not something you need to expend like a barbarian's rage. You are just resistant, period. You're going to be harder to hit. You're going to be harder to take down. Leaving a cleric on the battlefield is a good thing because clerics do a ton of damage, can wear the heavy armor and all that. So this is going to make you a pretty unstoppable force when it comes to combat. Making it my favorite choice for combat specific builds, uh, the ward domain cleric is a can't miss. So... That is going to wrap up the d Divine Domain options available to you at first level. If you haven't checked out some of the other options, see our, uh, our videos for the Cleric that will walk you through these domains. These are all the domains that are available to you in the Player's Handbook. They are the Knowledge, Life, Light, Nature, Tempest, Trickery, and war domain now there are other options and other supplements that are out there like tasha's cauldron of everything xanathar's guide to everything and some other third party um uh options like dungeons of drakenheim by the dungeon dudes or critical roles campaign settings they have additional subclasses and things but this covers what is in your player's handbook so that wraps up our discussion on building a cleric and what clerics can do. Next up on our list is to dive into the druid class. So don't miss it and come right back here next week when we kick off with that. Until we see you again, keep rolling those dice and we'll see you at the table.